o'clock. We go ahead and get started. There's like a few, like a few stragglers coming in. We're going to get started. Amen. Amen. But uh, we're glad to see each and every one of you this evening. Thank you for being here. And uh, I, y'all, for once, it's colder outside than it is inside. Amen. Amen. So uh, thank you for being here. And, and uh, winter has finally, I think, fall or the winter has got here quickly. Amen. Uh, as we get started this evening, let me remind you of a few things. Uh, don't forget choir practice. Are you going to be 4.30 again this Sunday? Let's uh, say 4.30. So say 4.30. Choir practice again this Sunday at 4.30. Of course, they're doing play practice right now. And on Sunday evenings, the uh, winter clothes and dry. They want to encourage you any extra winter clothes and blankets to be bringing those in. Uh, and also the Happy Singers of Faith will be meeting next Thursday, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, and encourage y'all to come out. I believe they're going to the nursing home next Thursday, and if you are going to the nursing home, would you sign up? No, it's tomorrow. Oh, is it tomorrow? I'm sorry. Yeah, to the nursing home tomorrow. And tomorrow? Next is our Thanksgiving. Okay, so I'm sorry. I was thinking it was I was thinking the November 21st. I was thinking it's next one. You go to the, to the nursing home tomorrow. Okay. All right, they're going to Mars. So see Elaine about that. I, I said it wrong, didn't I? So see her about that if you'd like to go to Mars because she's trying to get an idea of how many people are going, right? We got six. We got six so far. All right, I'm glad you told me because I got to put gas in the van. I thought it was next week. No. Okay. Hey, been somebody's been having to push the van on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hey, Ben. Is it, I think that's all the announcements that I've got up here. Um, it will be in the, the bulletin next week. Did Helen tell you about that? About the, the okay. Uh, if you have not uh, added your name, wrote your name down there on the, the list, she's updating our, our um, directory, and she's putting new pictures in there. If you got a picture from two years ago and you want to update it, or you want to add your name into the directory, please write your name down there, and Sister Helen will contact you and get with you uh, on the information and get a new picture in there and everything like that. Uh, we need, we, we're going to be printing out a, a hard copy, too, uh, in January, so she's trying to get all that corrected and updated. Amen? I think that's all of my announcements for the, this evening. Uh, Brother Wayne, we'll turn it over to you. Let's go up with a word of prayer. Let's all stand up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day you've given us, Lord. We just thank you for your grace and mercy that you show us every day, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, Lord, and sing praises to you and hear the preached word, Father. We pray that the word will change us, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, to just just have your way in our service tonight, God. Be with Pastor Zach as he brings the word. Be with us as we worship. Thank you for Jesus. It's his name we pray. And everybody said, Give the Lord a hand up and pray. Oh, what a shout we ride across the park and sky When Jesus comes in the cloud We'll be all pain and care and in this glory share When Jesus comes in the cloud When Jesus comes in glory bright We'll be the Lord
congregational song, but I thought it was pretty appropriate that we sing it. So, y'all worship it. Sing it with us. Sing it out. I hear the sound of a rushing mighty wind. And it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet. Bye. 
Uh, I saw Brother Gene uh, on Monday, and Brother Gene, he had about four or six good weeks there. He was doing really well, and then, it, then he said the bottom was pulled out from under him, and he, he barely got out of bed on Monday. So uh, he just said, please be praying for him and remembering him. And we've got other people in the church that's been sick and been standing in need. Please remember to pray for them. If you know somebody in particular, uh, if, if, let me know also. If somebody is sick or away from us and they're sick or in the hospital, please let me know. Because if you don't let me know, I don't have ESPN and I, I don't know. <laughs> Amen? So uh, I don't have that uh, knowledge without you let me know if you're in need. So please, please call me and I'll be able to go to everybody there and check on you. But check on those that are away from us. Uh, this evening, I want us to look back uh, last week, the last few weeks we've been preaching a little bit about the rapture. We started in 1 Thessalonians. We've been going through the book of 1 Thessalonians. We got to chapter 4 and uh, got kind of studying and talking about the coming of the Lord. And that led me on to preaching a little bit about the rapture. I talked uh, to you last week about the rapture. I gave you the definition of that word, rapture, simply it's the catching away. Amen. It's the snatching away of, of God's people, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the Bible says that one day that the Lord is going to descend uh, with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ are going to rise. And that we that are alive and remain, it says, are going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, all this is going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. It's going to happen just within a split second. We're going to be called up to meet the Lord in the air. I still believe and I still preach that that's going to happen. The rapture of the church is what is known as Bible prophecy. What's what we're preaching on tonight? Bible prophecy. It has not happened yet, but according to the Word of God, right here, it's going to happen one day. And I believe that it's something that's not uh, that needs to be preached on. I haven't really preached on it in about in over two years. I was looking back in some notes. I haven't brought it up or preached on it in about two years. And so I felt led to kind of share with this, share again with you uh, about the rapture of the church. And we're going to do that this evening. We're going to go a little bit deeper. And looking at the when of the rapture, the when of the rapture. Now, don't think that I'm fixing to get up here and I'm fixing to give you a day and a year <laughs> and a time. Amen. That's not what I'm talking about whatsoever because the Bible says, Jesus says, that no man knows, no man knows uh, when the Lord's going to happen. The Bible talks about over and over and over again that it would be a sudden that he would come as a thief in the night. Nobody knows, but we are uh, we are instructed, we are commanded over and over and over with, throughout Scripture to watch and be looking for the return of the Lord. It's going to take place suddenly, and therefore we need to be prepared. But I still want to talk about the when of the rapture in regards or connection to the tribulation period. In, in Bible prophecy and teaching, the, towards the end of time, the tribulation and the rapture are connected. And so that's what I want to preach to you uh, about this evening in connection to the tribulation. Now, while most all uh, Christian folks believe in the tribulation period, they are some differing on when the rapture would take place in regards to the tribulation and we're going to look at that tonight. But first, let's pray. I didn't pray. Let's pray before we look at this uh, this evening. Heavenly Father, we come before you one more time this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for the opportunity to sing praises unto you this evening. And God, now as we come to dig into your word, Father God, I just pray for the anointing of God. Let that Holy Spirit touch me, touch my tongue, touch my heart, my mouth. Oh God, that I may be poured out as a vessel over this congregation. And I pray that you open up the hearts of this congregation, the minds. Let them receive understanding of this teaching. Father God, this is your word. This is not my opinion, but God, this is your word. And I pray, God, that it would be found as truth unto this congregation today. And that each one of us, each one of us in here tonight, we would be prepared to meet you if you were to come back tonight, Lord. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. Let us be watchful, Lord, of your return in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. amen. And amen. Now, I don't think I didn't have enough room, and I had to 
squish your notes down because I got a lot of notes. So I'm going to try and talk as fast as my southern tongue will allow me to talk tonight. But there are a lot of differences of opinion of when the rapture will take place uh, in connection to the tribulation. There are many that will teach, and what I'm going to preach tonight is what is known as the pre-tribulation rapture. Man, will you go ahead and put that, that, that picture up here? There are many that will preach, and what we're going to be preaching tonight is a pre-tribulation rapture. Is a rapture before the seven-year period of known as the tribulation is going to take place. There is some that will preach what is known as a partial rapture of the church. Only a certain ones are overcomers that carnal Christians that won't go in the rapture. There are others that will preach as a, what is called as a mid-tribulation rapture. Right in the middle of seven years is what? Three and a half years. There's some believe that, that what, what is talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 will happen in the middle of the tribulation. There's some that say that it will happen three quarters of the way through the tribulation. And then there's some that say, well, it's just going to happen at the end of the tribulation. Our focus tonight and what I'm going to preach is the picture that you see before you, that there's going to be a rapture of the church before the tribulation takes place on this earth. But now in order for us to understand that and for me to, uh, to explain to you why I believe and preach that the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation, first of all, we need to understand, well, what is the tribulation? What is the purpose of the tribulation? Well, let's look at this for just a few minutes, and I'm going to give you a lot of scripture tonight. Because I don't want you thinking, well, this is just Zach's crazy idea, amen. I want to back it up over and over again throughout uh, our preaching and teaching tonight with Scripture. Well, first of all, let's answer this question. Where do we get seven years of tribulation? Where do we get this timeline from or this amount of time? Well, that number, that seven-year period is found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. I'll show it to you. And it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. One week. Everybody say week. Amen. It says for one week. Now, if y'all will remember, on Sunday mornings, if you have been here, I have been preaching or have been preaching on Daniel. And I took most of our focus and I stayed in chapters 1 through 6. I did preach a little bit in chapter 12. The first half of the book of Daniel is history based. It's about the life of Daniel. It's about Daniel coming to Babylon. It's about Daniel, uh, uh, his fasting, and his. Uh, it's about Daniel going into the lion's den. It's about Meshach and Shadrach going into the fiery furnace. It's history. It's about what happened to them while they were in Babylon. But when you get to the last half of the book of Daniel, which I did not get into, that's why we're getting into it tonight. It is prophecy based. It is, it is what, what Daniel had received through visions, through dreams, and even directly from the angel Gabriel himself. He writes about it in the last half of the book of Daniel. It was things to come. It was prophecy. Some of those things have been fulfilled that Daniel writes about, that he dreamed about, that he had visions of. But there are some things that Daniel wrote about that have not come to pass yet and that are in our future and are in the future of the world. One of those things that Daniel writes about, I believe it's in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, it is known as the 70 weeks of of Daniel, the 77s or the 70 weeks of Daniel, and the prophet, excuse me, the prophet, the angel Gabriel, Gabriel, the same one that went unto Mary, the same one that went unto Joseph, if you will remember at Christmas time, and said, hey, you're going to have a baby, Joseph, Mary's going to have a baby, that same angel in the, in the scriptures comes unto Daniel, as Daniel is praying and praying in repentance for the sins of Israel, Gabriel comes and reveals himself to Daniel, and he says, Daniel, I have something to tell you. I have something to share with you about the future of your people. And he says there's going to be a time of 70 weeks or 70 sevens. He breaks it down, and then he breaks it down, and he says there's going to be, let me make sure that I get it right here. I believe it's 62. 
He says there, he begins to break that 70 weeks down. And he says, first, from this time here now, there's going to be seven weeks, which is 49 years. And that's what it's going to take to rebuild Jerusalem. And he said, then there's going to be 62 weeks. And that's going to be the time until the Messiah. It, and I don't have time to go back through that prophecy of the 70 weeks. If you were to go back and, re, and look at the, the timeline of this, because I did it, but I never did preach it on Sunday morning, because I knew it would be way too much for the Sunday morning crowd. If you go back and look, when Daniel, when Gabriel came to him, and remember, and, and it, it speaks about the rebuilding of Jerusalem from the time of Daniel to the time that Jerusalem, Israel, uh, Jerusalem is rebuilt, it's almost exactly what Gabriel said it would be. It's that seven weeks or 49 years. And if you add the time going on from there, another 62 weeks, which is 434 years or something like that, I believe, it is actually the time when the Messiah came, when Jesus came and he was cut down. But then that leaves us with one week left. One week left, but it hadn't been fulfilled yet. That week has not been fulfilled yet. That's the week that we just read about in verse 27 there. It says, And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of that, he's going to break it. He ceases the sacrifice and the oblation uh, will cease. Now, this is talking about a future event that we call the, or the, the tribulation. You say, well, why was it Paul? They, they call it in prophecy, they call it a parenthesis or a pause in the prophetic clock. And so I've been studying a lot on this. I've been reading a lot of this in Daniel. And that pause was this. Why has that, why has that last week not been fulfilled yet? Remember I told you it come up to the time of Messiah? What happened after Jesus and after the cross? What, what dispensation did we start into the church age? There's a pause in the prophetic clock. And now all the Gentiles are coming in to be saved, but we've got one week left. One week left. Now, let me don't be thrown off by that word week there. That doesn't mean actually seven days. But the actual Hebrew word there is Shabua, and it literally means a week of years. In other words, one week would be seven years. Amen. So what we're looking at from Daniel, y'all looking at me, some of y'all looking at me like this right here. You'll get it, amen, that's all right. But I want to show you this as you study that, and there's so much more depth that I could go into it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to scratch the left, scratch the surface and get surface and get a little bit deeper, but at the same time, I'm trying to give you an overview of where we get the understanding of the tribulation and the rapture. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I don't have time to go through every single little detail. I'm trying to give you an overview to understand where this comes from. That's where we get the length of the tribulation. It comes out of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. That last week has yet to be fulfilled, but it's going to happen, I believe, without the shadow of a doubt. It's going to happen when the Lord gets ready. Amen. After the church age has been fulfilled to the Lord. Now let's look at this verse a little bit further. And it says, and he shall confirm the covenant. Well, who is the he in that scripture there? Who is this referring to? And if you were to go back and study this passage, and I can point out some other things to you, we find that this is the Antichrist. The Antichrist. He is the one that's going to come during the tribulation. He's going to come in as a savior with the answers to all of the world's problems. And he's going to be established, really, a one-world government and a one-world power, which he's going to head up. I think that in the next few weeks, as the Lord leads me, I want to do a character study and talk just about the Antichrist. He's also known as the beast in Revelation chapter 13. There's a lot of interesting things that we find in scriptures about the Antichrist, or as Revelation calls him, the beast. But now it says this about the Antichrist, who's going to come. His power will come from who? The devil. Amen. That's where he's going to get his power. And the Bible talks about how it talks about the dragon, who is the devil, the Antichrist, and then it talks about the false prophet. It just like there is a holy trinity, 
In the end of time, there's going to be a demonic trinity that's going to be established to work against God's people and against, uh, against really, uh, uh, the, just against the world in general. It's going to be established, but at the end of time, God is going to defeat all three of them. Amen. Amen. Powers of evil be completely laid to what? But he, this passage is speaking about, is the Antichrist who speaks about in Revelation chapter 13. And as I said, we're going to look at him a little bit more, but he's going to come in during that tribulation period as a savior. He's going to solve so many of the world's problems. He will be a world leader, not a national leader, but he's going to be a world leader and have world power uh, we're going to look at later on. And he's going to establish a treaty, and that treaty is going to be a treaty of peace, and it's going to really be centered on the nation of Israel. Because Israel is going to be the center of attention in the last days. But in halfway through that treaty, halfway through that seven-year period, three and a half years, that treaty is going to be broke, just like it says there. In the midst of the week, three and a half years in, he's going to interrupt worship to God in all ways, in all forms. He's going to establish what Jesus said in Matthew and also what is wrote about in other scriptures the abomination of desolation, he will set himself up on this earth as God and he will be commanded to be worshipped and says, you're going to have nobody else, you'll worship nobody else but me. That's going to happen in the tribulation period. Amen. A man, just like, y'all remember we were studying Daniel? And y'all remember the king and, that, the, and the, um, and the, uh, and under Darius, they established a law that nobody could pray to anybody else. Y'all remember me preaching about that? Nobody else. They could pray to nobody else, no other God except the king, under Darius. And if they did, what was going to happen to them? They got thrown in what? The lion's den. Remember, they were going to be killed. That's going to happen again, and it's going to happen worldwide during the last three and a half years of the tribulation. That's going to happen again. A man will be established upon the earth, and he says, you will worship nobody but me, and if you do, you're going to be killed. Amen. Mm. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be here during that period of time. Amen. He's going to, the, the devil is going to try and rule and reign in those three and a half years, but there's something else that we also need to, to understand. Also now, let, let me point this out before I overlook it. Daniel speaks of this. Daniel speaks about how that seven-year period will be interrupted and that, and that the Antichrist is going to have such full power and reign in the last three and a half years, but also Revelation speaks about this. Daniel writes about it, but John the Revelator writes about it some 600 plus years later after Daniel. Here's one verse in Revelations 11. But the court, but the court which is without the temple, leave out and the measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city. What's the holy city in Scripture? That's Jerusalem. Shall be treaded underfoot for 42 months. If you do your math, that's three and a half months years. Three and a half years where this Antichrist is going to set himself up and he says, I am king, I'm God. And then it says in another passage of scripture in chapter 13, and there was given unto him a mouth of speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. That's three and a half years he, that he's going to kind of rule, if you will, on the earth in this Power, amen. Now, think about this. So, we know that, that the Antichrist is going to have demonic power and strongholds in the world during that time. But it is also, there's another purpose or, or something else is going to be going on on the earth during that time. We see demonic power is going to be exploding, but also during the tribulation. It is going to be a time of God's wrath and judgment upon this earth. The tribulation period, especially the last three and a half years, is going to be a time of God, God Almighty's wrath and judgment upon this earth. Let me back up that up with some scriptures this evening. Let's look at these scriptures. Revelation chapter 6. You can go back and study these, but I'll tell you, I asked the man to put them on the screen tonight. 
and said to the mountains in the, and the rocks, this is these that are fought, that are hiding during that time. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's Christ. For that great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Listen to Revelation 15, 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. Amen. Now, I, I'm not going to go into each, and in, each individual uh, uh, encounter or episode, but you can also go back and read through the book of Revelations and you will find what's going to be happening in the book of Revelations is that uh, there's going to be seven seals that are going to be broken, and each time those seals are broken, something happens on the earth. Also, you will read about the blowing of seven trumpets, angels that have seven different trumpets, and every time they blow one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, something happens upon the earth. A judgment takes place upon the earth. And then it gets to the last place, as we've just read right here, in chapter 15, you get there where there are seven bowls of God's wrath that are poured out upon the earth in judgment of the wicked. Amen. Listen to me right now. I'm just telling you, earth is not going to be the place to be during the tribulation. It's not going to be the place to be during the tribulation. For in them is filled up the what of God? The wrath of God. Amen. It is a time of God's wrath and God's judgment on the earth. Y'all know what? How many of you have ever looked around and you look and, and you scratch your head and you say, God, why do you continue to let all these evil things happen? Why do you let these evil people prosper? Why do you allow evil to run rampant and the, the world getting as wicked as it is? Listen to me right now. There's a payday Sunday. Yes. And the by word of God declares that it's going to take place. You can count on it. You can take it to the bank. There is a payday someday. So don't get discouraged. Do not. That's why, what did the Lord say? Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. Amen. He's going to clean. I'm going to tell you, he's going to clean their cloud. They will know that he is God because the wrath of the Lamb will be poured out upon this earth. And there will be no one on the earth that's going to be able to stop it. Amen. Now, also, that this is going to be a time of the wrath of the Lamb upon the earth. The prophets saw this, the final days of God's wrath. You can go back and read those verses. I, I put the list there. They saw it, the prophets, even of the old. They saw it as a day of God's vengeance, Isaiah, and second, first, second Thessalonians. It's a day of God's judgment, Romans, Jude, Revelation. It's a day of God's wrath, Revelations, of the, all those verses that we just read. Listen to what Jesus himself said about this time period on the earth in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, not even ever, or excuse me, no, not ever, nor ever shall be. Amen. I couldn't see that. It was a nor or not up there. But nor shall there ever be. Jesus said that in these last days, the world is going to go through such great tribulation and it has never, ever, ever been. Listen to me. How many of you, you, you know in history the Holocaust? Yeah. Six million Jews were annihilated uh, by Hitler. He's going to make the Antichrist and the things that are going to happen on this earth is going to make Hitler look like a choir, choir boy. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it will be nothing to the death and the devastation. World War II was bad. Man. World War I was bad. All of the other wars that we fought in between were terrible. Can I tell you something? This is truly going to be a world in chaos. A world, not a nation or a region, but a world. Not one, one place is not going to be touched uh, in these events. Amen. We need to understand that. He says it's going to be great tribulation. <coughs> mm. It's literally going to be hell on earth. Yes. You don't want to be here. Amen. Woo. And so I got some good news for you. You say, well, Pastor, this is looking like a doom and gloom in here tonight now. 
I don't like this doom and gloom. This ain't doom and gloom if you're a Christian, amen. This isn't doom and gloom if you're a child of God, amen. You want to know why? Because the Word of God, I've showed you example after example. Now I'm going to show you some examples because we're told also in the Word of God that we can escape the wrath to come. It's a time of wrath. It's going to be a time of God's judgment on this earth. And can I tell you something? We're told over and over throughout Scripture we can escape this wrath to come. Let's look at some Scriptures on there. You, I've listed them on your paper. And you can go back and study them yourself. Luke chapter 21. Jesus says this. Watch ye therefore. He tells us, tells us this over and over and over throughout Scripture. They meant to watch, to be prepared. Pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are to come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. If you go back and read chapter 21, he lists up all the different things that are going to come on the earth. He lists, he also, right before this, he talks about the Antichrist himself. And so he says this, he says, be prepared. And he says, you can escape these things that are, that are going to come on the earth. Amen. He says, watch and be prepared. Amen. Listen to Nahum, verse 1, verse 2. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. Isn't that what I just said a minute ago? That the Lord vengeance his mind, thus saith the Lord. We think that the wicked, we think the wicked are truly abounding. Oh, no, they're not. I said, oh, no, they're not. The sinner and the lost, they might have pleasure in sin for a season, but my goodness, think about the end that waits on them. Think about the end that waits on them. If they on this earth, they're going to go through hell on earth. But then once they, they're dead, guess what? They're going to go through hell for eternity. Amen. Hell is real. Do you hear what I'm saying? Hell is real. Yes. And just as sure as I'm standing on this stage tonight, you're going if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's a fact, Jack. That's a fact, Jack. I believe there's going to be hell on this earth yes. before the Lord puts his foot on the Mount of Olives again. Nathan says this, the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for who? His enemies. Amen. He reserves wrath. What did I tell you? Tribulation is going to be a period of what? Wrath. Who is his uh, uh, wrath reserved for? His enemies. Listen to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We've been there preaching that. This is where I told you where the revelation of the rapture comes from. We talked about chapter 4. Now listen to what Paul writes in chapter 5. For God has not appointed us to what? Wrath. Right. There's that word again. Y'all noticing that? But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we're awake or asleep, we should live together where? With Him. Amen. He says this, that we are not appointed unto His wrath. Jesus has already taken the wrath of God upon Himself on the cross for you and me. We don't have to face that wrath. Amen. Listen to this scripture. One more. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon who? The children of disobedience. Remember that the tribulation is about what? The wrath of God, the judgment of God. The wrath of God is reserved for the children of disobedience, for the, for the sinner, but chastisement is for the believer. The wrath of God is for the unbeliever, for the sinner, but the chastise, chastisement is for the believer. There's a difference, amen, in Scripture. Chastisement is for a son of God and a child of God, but the wrath of God, as I just showed you, is for unbelievers, amen, and for the wicked. Now, the Bible tells us this, that we all go through tribulations on this earth. We all go. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus said, you shall have tribulations in this world. He's talking about troubles, trials, heartache, sorrow. Each and every one of us are not exempt from tribulations, worldly tribulations of sorrow. Right? Amen? If any of you are, you're lying. I'm going to tell you right now. We all go through sorrows. Now, but get this. 
But we as believers also are chastised in order for the Lord to draw up His children unto repentance. I believe this, that the Lord knows how to get our attention. Amen. Amen. He knows when we stray away from Him as a child of God. How many of you as fathers and mothers and grandparents, when your child begins to push you so far, well, that's what you used to do, amen. Now we probably put them in a corner, take their phone or some other thing. But used to, what would happen if we got, there was a chastisement that came. Why did you chastise your children, your daughters, and your son? Because you loved them, amen. amen. You didn't want them to be little hoodlums, amen, when they left your house and acted like dummies, amen. <laughs> and you chastised them and still acted like dummies, amen, but that's all right. But, they, but they, you've done that be out of love, amen. Anybody ever had to, to listen or you had to say that line, I'm just doing this because I love you, amen? <laughs> I don't know about all that, amen? I ain't a parent yet. I don't, I don't, I don't see that out of love. I see that out of anger, amen? But, but when you do it out of love, God does the same thing for his children. He chastises his children, but his wrath, he laid down on Jesus Christ. He laid down Jesus Christ. Jesus already took the wrath of God for you and me. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. I don't think I told a man to put this on there. It's noted uh, underneath wrath is for sinners, chastisement is for the believer. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastises and scourges every son whom he receives. Amen. Now, go back and look at that verse. I'm trying to point out to you that wrath is for the wicked and the unbelievers, but chastisement is that is different. It is for just the believers. We are not meant for the wrath of God that's going to come in the tribulation period. Now let me back this up a little bit further. I ain't done with that yet. Let, let me to further back this up, let me point out some biblical examples of the righteous escaping the judgment and the wrath of God. Are there other examples in Scripture where God delivered the righteous out of the path of His judgment? Are there other examples in the Scripture where God removed them and destroyed the wicked? Well, yeah, there is. Y'all remember a guy by the name of Noah? Mm -hmm. Hebrews says this in verse, chapter 11, verse 7. But by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the, which he commended, condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. What happened with old Noah? God said there's going to be a flood. I'm going to wipe this world out. But remember the Bible talks about how Noah found favor with the Lord, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah, God told Noah, he said, I want you to build me an ark. It had never ever reigned on the earth until that time. Before, before the flood came, never had a drop of water drop from the spraying cloud and hit the earth. Never had it rained before. Go back and read that story. Maybe you forgot it. The Bible says that the dew and mist would come up and water the ground. But it had never, ever rained. And God goes to Moses, I mean to Noah and says, Noah, build an ark. The flood's coming. I'm going to flood this, this earth. And for over 100 years, he worked on that ark. He built that ark. He preached that the flood was coming. But nobody listened to him. Right. But what happened before the flood came? The Bible says Noah and his family, God put them in the ark and God shut them in. God sealed that ark, shut them up from his judgment and his wrath, and he delivered them through that ark of safety. Amen. Think about another, another example to me that is, is, that is truly connected with the deliverance of God and Him removing the righteous out of the way of His judgment would be that of Lot. The story of, of Lot in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25. That be, this is, that be far from thee, Abraham speaking unto God, to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. Abraham knew God pretty well. He was on a first uh, name basis, if you will, speaking to God. He said, God, I know that you would not slay the righteous with the wicked, 
and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right. He said, I know that you are the judge of all the earth and you shall do right. And then we read in Genesis chapter 19 of how Abraham, if you remember the story, Abraham prayed, God had went to him and said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham prayed, he said, he said, Lord, would you destroy if there was 50 righteous people there? And then he said, well, Lord, that's kind of a rough place. Let's, let's go to 40 righteous people. And then he got down to 30, and he got to 20, and he finally got to 10. Lord, would you please spare that city? There's just 10 righteous people there. And God said, I'll spare it. But they couldn't even find 10 righteous people in that city. And the Bible says this, that even Abraham had to intervene and pray, and God sent two angels down there to get Lot out and his family out of that city. And even Lot and him, to begin with, they didn't want to go, but the angels took them by the hand and pulled them out, the Bible says. I believe that's exactly what's going to happen to us, amen. Before that tribulation comes, the Lord's going to send his angels, and we will be pulled out of here. Listen to what the angel told him in, in Genesis chapter 19. Haste thee, or hurry up, is what he's saying there in the King James. Haste thee, hurry up, escape from here, thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. thither. Amen. That's King James. That's a straight up King James version. Amen. In other words, what he's saying, he tells uh, Lot and his family, hurry up and get out of here. He says, because I cannot do anything to this city until you're out of here. I truly believe that, that the wrath of God ain't going to come on this earth until we're out of here. Amen. Just as it's that angel, as it's the angel told Lot and his family, I can't do anything until you're out of here. I believe it's going to be the same way for us when, the, when during the tribulation we're going to be out of here before God begins to pour out his judgment and wrath. Another example of God sparing his people to do judgment, Exodus chapter 12. Uh, when, in, in the Hebrews, when they were in Egypt, chapter 12 says, For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians, and but when he sees the blood upon the doorposts, what will the Lord do? He will pass over you. Amen. They escape the judgment because of the blood. They escape the judgment because of the blood. How are we going to escape the judgment of the last day? It's going to be by the blood of the Lamb. There is no other way except by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. You look at Rahab, the story of Rahab. You can go back and look at her story. How God spared her. One that had placed her faith in the, in the one true God. There's other passages of Scripture that I put down there for you. But I truly believe this, church, that the tribulation is truly going to be the judgment and wrath that God poured out on this old earth. But I, as I have showed you in Scripture over and over again, we as the children of God are not meant for the wrath of God. Therefore, the rapture is going to be our escape hatch. It's going to be our escape route from that judgment and that wrath. Amen. You can pray up, back up, because we're going up in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. You can count on it. Now, let me quickly give you another reason. I gave you one reason why I believe... Uh, man, put that picture back here, please. I gave you one reason why I believe that we're going to be out of here before the tribulation takes place. Because the tribulation is what? The judgment and the wrath of God. And we're not meant for judgment and wrath. We're the children of God. We're going to be out of here. But let me give you another reason. And that really comes from the structure of the book of Revelation. We speak a lot about Revelation. We may go into that in a few weeks. But the book of Revelation really deals with three things. According to Revelation chapter 1 verse 4, it says this. John, to the seven churches, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. He says, write, uh, excuse me, to which are in Asia. He says, give to you the peace from which, excuse me, which is, which was, and which is to come. Let me reread that. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. What he's saying is, John, to the seven churches in Asia, write this. Grace be unto you in peace from which is, which was, and which is to come. The book of Revelation deals with three things. Do you remember I preached on this when I preached about the seven churches? The book of Revelation deals with three things which 
the things which was, the things which is, and the things which are to come. When we get into chapter 1 of the book of Revelation, we see the things which was. That was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8 says this. Jesus says, I didn't tell you to put that one up there. Okay, I didn't tell you to put that one up there. Amen. It says this. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am he that is alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and hell. That happened before in the past when John is writing that. That was what happened. His resurrection. But the next thing that he, he writes about is what is, what is current on currently, and that was to the churches, he writes, in chapters 2 and 3. And then he writes this, the things that is to come. That's talking about the judgments and the wrath of God. Yes, Lord. Amanda, we, now we can put up chapter 4. The book of Revelation is an interesting book. In, in chapter 1, we see him talking about who he was, what he did. Jesus died. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it talks about the churches, the churches, the seven churches. From chapter 1, 2, and 3, the word church, church, is said 19 times. It's used 19 times from chapters 1, 2, and 3. When you get to chapter 4, you never see the word church again. It is only briefly mentioned when you get to chapter 22, which is the end of the book of Revelations, when he tells John, make sure that they get this letter. It's never, the word church is never mentioned again, as it is in chapters 2 and 3 abundantly. Why? Because scholars believe this. Why? Because the church is out of here. Listen to, to Revelation chapter 4. Why do you think that? Listen to Revelation chapter 4. In chapters 2 and 3, he's talking to the churches. But then, it, we, then there's a transition, there's a change. And it is symbolized in the very first two words, after this. After this. That is specifically speaking back to at what he was just talking about, the church. We're in the what age, the church age. He says, after this. After the church age. After this, I looked. And behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was with, well, excuse me, was as it were as a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you these things which must, must be here after. And after that, John is in the throne room of heaven, and then after that we see him where the seals are opened, and then we see the scroll, or excuse me, then the trumpets, and then we see all these other judgments that come to pass until the end of the book of Revelations. But I want you to notice something here. Like I said a minute ago, after this verse, the church is never mentioned again, even until the very end of the book where he says, make sure they get this letter. But I want to point something out. This is another reason why I believe the church is going to be gone before the judgments come. But I want you to notice how this is very... The, the illustrative language of this is very similar to what we were studying last week in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Notice any similarities in that. Notice that a door was opened in heaven, and the first what? A voice. We read about a voice that's going to, to be heard when the Lord returned. But what did that voice sound like? It sounded like a what? A trumpet. But then notice it says this, talking with me, which said what? Come up. Amen. I believe that right there, Revelation chapter 4 is very symbolic of the rapture of the church and that we're going to be out of here. Now, all of these judgments don't play, take place until you get over into chapter 6. Now, I know that no mathematician but 4 comes before 6. Amen. I believe we're going to, I, sister, sister Amy taught me in, in uh, middle school math. That's why I can count to ten on my fingers. Amen. <laughs> but I believe that four comes before six. I believe we're going to be out of here before the wrath of God comes to this earth. Church, we out of time. Let me stop right there. Come on to the music. We got a last song tonight? I believe this. There's so, there's so much teaching on this particular subject that I could get into. I just had time for those two things. 
I believe this with all my heart. I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe in the tribulation. And I believe in the second coming of Christ when he's going to put his feet on the ground and rule with a rod of iron according to the word of God. But let me tell you something. As I pointed out to you in various scriptures, I believe that during the tribulation it's going to be hell on earth. Yes. I truly believe it's going to be hell on this earth. Let me tell you, and I'm going to get into this later on about the Antichrist. If you make a stand during that time period and you want to make a stand for Christ, at that point in time where he's established himself as God, and he says, you're no longer, you can no longer pray or worship anybody but me, do you know what? Do you want to know how you're going to get to heaven then? Beheaded. The Bible speaks in Revelation and talks about those who are that will be headed for the, their testimony. Amen. You think we got freedoms in the United States of America today? They're going to come to an end one day. Yes. Listen to me right now. You, you can write this down. The Constitution of the United States, in order for the Antichrist and there to be a one world power and government, the Constitution of the United States will have to be abolished. That'd be gone. Is it not eroding right before our very eyes Amen. every day? Amen. Let me tell you something. It is nothing, nothing, nothing but time and prophecy being fulfilled. Amen. The, the, the Constitution will have to be destroyed, dissolved, in order for there to be a one world power and government which talks about that. Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, it talks about how the Antichrist was given power over every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. It says that's a world power. Understand that. Let me preach it a little bit on that. The United States will understand the reason America is headed the direction it is, and, and I believe we've had a window of mercy with the president that we have right now and some of the things that's going on and push back against some of this foolishness. But I'm telling you right now, the, the giant down climb, climb and downslide right now of, of, of sin that we see, it's just a fulfilling of time. I'm telling you, it's just a fulfilling of time. I'm telling you, we need to be ready and prepared. Our hearts need to be prepared. Because honestly, there's nothing in Scripture. I believe there's nothing right now in Scripture that can stop the Lord from coming back to death. He can come back to death. How is it so? How in the world will one man, the Antichrist, how will this one man rise to power? How will he, how will he think about this? I, I, I'm not going to get in this place, but I'll give you a little window. If the church is raptured out, Pew Research says there's roughly 2 billion Christians on the planet. I firmly believe all of them Christians. I believe they're, they're, their definition of a Christian is probably a little different. They might, you know, there's a lot of people who I'm a Christian, but. Imagine, though, if a billion or two billion people disappeared off the face of the earth, the world would fall into chaos. Banks would be shut down. Imagine, imagine, y'all thought it was bad around here when we had a hurricane? You think they cleaned out when we had a hurricane? Imagine a national and a world disaster that wouldn't be in a food. I'm telling you right now, the world would go into chaos. Whoo, I'm just telling you. You say, well, it could happen. Oh, yes, it could. And I'm telling you, we need to be prepared. Our hearts need to be prepared because the Lord can come back in. I'm going to get into that a little bit. I'll, I'll be preached another sermon if I don't stop right there. Amen. Stand your feet all over the house. I'll ask you this question as we're closing. If the Lord was to come back tonight, whether he came back in, in the class or whether we met him in death, are you ready to meet your Savior? They, well, truly, there's only two people that know the answer to that question. Truly, that is you and that's the Lord. Are you truly ready to meet your Savior if he come back tonight? As we sing this song, we're going to sing a verse and a chorus. You got the opportunity to come, come pray. You need to pray this evening as we close. Amen. Mm -hmm.